uh, looks like that uh, uh, the government uh, has shown a kind of questionable understanding of, of a liberal democracy and economic policy mainly because I work in economic newspapers so I have to follow all the twists of the government and it's not easy task. Uh, but on the other side, if you look on what is written mainly in Western press, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of critic, a lot of critics of Hungary uh, has demonstrated a kind of a lack of knowledge uh, of the Hungarian society and history, uh, where you can uh, see quite often the roots of recent government policies. Uh, as a result, uh, I see that. Uh, we can see the picture of more and more international isolated Hungary, uh, either for uh, internal or external reasons. Uh, we also live in quite um, lively times in these days. As I mentioned, um, uh, tomorrow there is going to be the, the anniversary of Hungarian anti-communist uprising from 1956. Uh, and um, uh, if we look at the title on media and, and democracy and is Hungary still a democracy? I have to quote uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister Karol Schwarzenberg, who was on Friday at the reception and has said that if um, anybody has seen, as he personally, Hungarians fighting in 1956 uh, for freedom, that there is no doubt that um, uh, democracy in Hungary is not in danger. Uh, will not be in danger, and so this is the topic quite uh, directly connected to it, with, with our discussion. Tomorrow there's also going to be the big demonstration in Budapest uh, of the opposition which is trying to unite itself. Now, uh, two of them, two of the two of big government, it's usual, it's, it's, you have to you know balance the things. Uh, for me, it's quite interesting to see the emergence, uh, 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 personality of Mr. Gordon Bainai, former prime minister, as um, uh, in his attempt to unite opposition, which we can talk about it later if it's uh, serious or less serious. Uh, for me, as a, as, a, as a journalist from economic newspaper, it's kind of interesting to see the uh, twists in fiscal policies and of the government uh, last, and which is kind of an illustration of how how the government is sending the signals towards the the, the outside world. When you have um, one uh, fiscal policy two weeks ago, and then last week, uh, the, the 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 Ministry of Economy is coming with uh, let's say different vision and different numbers, and uh, which as we speak with the business. And, they, and, and the economists, they say that uh, the main signal which this government sends, uh, not just to the domestic economic environment, but to the outsiders, that there is instability and unpredictability of the of the of the of the, of the situation. And um, with the discussions around new electoral law, about the uh, uh, new setup of the of the justice system, we see that uh, uh, like more systemic features of change of political system in, in, in Hungary. So um, um, we have tried with the organizers to formulate three um, uh, questions to frame our discussion. The first one is, um, is Western or liberal model of development discredited in the eyes of most Hungarians, or majority of Hungarians? What do disputes over the media law show, or has shown? Uh, the second question is, is the foreign perception of Hungary close to reality? Uh, is the international community able to understand the average Hungarian way of thinking? And the third question, uh, is this first example of post-communist transition based on liberal values being overpowered by deeper traditions based on nationalism? In other words, is uh, really um, Hungary in danger of uh, returning to, to different kind of policies than we were used in the last 20, 22 years to see in, in, in Central Europe. Um, I, would, I would ask uh, Mr. Harashti for the, the uh, Mr. Stumpf. Okay, so Mr. Stumpf <coughs> for, the, for, the, for the first words. Thank you, Martin. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you for the invitation to this wonderful city. Ten years ago, uh, I've been here for the first time, and it was really a great experience, although I had no chance to look around here really well. I was back then coming to see the Rolling Stones uh, in 2003, by the way, uh, one of the favorite bands of late Mr. President Havel, as far as I'm concerned. 
Um, secondly, let me express my hope that this discussion is not limited to, to answer the question that's in the title of the panel. Uh, if so, it is not necessarily wrong either, then I will have much more time for sightseeing. The question I'm talking about is Hungary still a democracy? Uh, and this question is very, very shortly to be answered, and the answer is yes. The question, however, has some claims in it. First, it implies that Hungary was a democracy. Secondly, the still in this sentence suggests that now, nowadays there is some reason to doubt that. Of course, there is always a reason to doubt. It just depends on uh, how you define democracy. Some are using it as a synonym for the perfect society, the Garden of Eden. From this point of view, uh, I have to tell you, Hungary is not a democracy and never has been, as no other country in the world, ever. Others take the view that democracy is a system where citizens choose their leaders and are legally entitled to get rid of them if they are dis dissatisfied with them. From this point of view, Hungary is a democracy for sure. Uh, without wanting to offend anyone, I have to say quite straightforward, this question is ridiculous. Just as silly as if you would ask, is the Czech Republic still a democracy or Romania or the United States of America? Of course, I'm not naive. I understand the implications uh, of this question. The fact that a party has the two-thirds of the seats in the Hungarian parliament, more than two-thirds, might be and is unusual. So the question is, if you don't want to have it as, um, as an insulting question to a whole country, uh, it goes, does the Fidesz government respect the independence of the democratic institutions? Are the branches of power separated? Do the much-discussed checks and balances still work in Hungary? The good news is that they are. The political system is fundamentally the same as it was uh, from 1990. Uh, the new constitution, which we were talking about a lot, is not really new. Hungary is still a parliamentary democracy. Um, there was a chance to get to a presidential system or something with two-thirds, Fidesz can do anything they want, but they did not change this. Uh, it's a parliamentary democracy, uh, and the institutions are almost the same. Some of them uh, have less power than before, it's true. Uh, but if they want to balance the government or the parliament, they are able to do that legally. For example, there's the Constitutional Court, one of the most uh, um, important ones. Uh, this has the right to annul the laws uh, which deemed uh, unconstitutional. They don't have the right anymore to test economical laws taxes, uh, but if, they, their argument, uh, they, if, but if their ar argumentation is based upon the violation of human dignity, they still can. This is what they did last year, where they annulled articles of a tax law. It was also the Hungarian Constitutional Court that annulled the much-discussed articles of the new media legislation. This is their job, they just fulfill it. By the way, members, members of the Constitutional Court are elected by a two-third majority in the Parliament. If it's not democratic, then what shall we say about the US? Probably we should say the US is not a democracy and never has been. There, the Supreme Court members are appointed by the President of the United States. Only a simple majority of the Senate is needed. In case of the institution which is the most important checker and balancer, this is that easy. By the way, President Reagan has often played around with this opportunity to achieve some political goals. Nevertheless, we are not in the least worried about the US commitment to democracy. It would be just ridiculous just as much as it is when these claims are related to Hungary. There is no doubt that the government and the Fidesz parliamentary majority sometimes ignores the rules of the game, of the democratic game, and although legally, because of the two-thirds, uh, sometimes they are violating the constitution. Let me just mention one actual, actual example. The, the idea of the pre-registration pre before the elections. They just wrote the detailed rules of this into the Constitution, so it can't be tested by the Constitutional Court. No one can say it's against the Constitution because it's part of it. This kind of process, as we all see, isn't carried out really gracefully. But what do we get in the end as a result? A system where the citizens have to sign up for the elections if they want to vote. 
they have to decide no later than t two weeks before <coughs> before the elections. Sorry, yeah. uh, if they want to participate or not, uh, they don't have to decide who will uh, who they uh, will vote for. Only that they take part or not. Is it undemocratic? Not at all. Every adult citizen uh, has the right to register. No one is excluded. The registration is, by the way, usually in the US, in France, in many countries of the so-called free world. Another question is if it's necessary in Hungary to have this new system. The state has his own, uh, its own regi register. It worked well for 20 years. So we might say it's totally un unnecessary. We also might say the way the government enacts laws, ideas, is sometimes tasteless. But after all, taste is quite a subjective category. Media, the same thing. Uh, it was a question if uh, a new media law was needed. I don't, I don't think so. In some parts, yes, but, uh, but the, this much discussed things uh, were absolutely unnecessary. But what we see after almost two years uh, after this uh, enacting this law, uh, nothing really has been changed. Uh, we have, we have uh, a country where, where public debate uh, with public debate, uh, with uh, oppositional newspapers, televisions, radios, it's every normal democratic country. So um, the hysteria that began almost two years ago on the 2nd de December of 2010, where some newspapers, uh, for example, Magyar Naranj, uh, came out with, with blank pa uh, front pages uh, telling the world that, uh, that the media freedom is, is, is over in Hungary. These, were, uh, these, uh, these fears were just not true. Uh, and, of course, it, uh, it doesn't mean that we can be satisfied with, with, with some argumentation like that. Nothing, nothing has happened, and it's okay. If there's a chance to happen, if, if there would be a chance for the new media council to ban papers uh, to, uh, because of opinions or, or, or to fine anyone, uh, any newspaper or television program. That would be a problem, but uh, in fact, they don't have the right to do this. I don't want to, to speak about particular uh, little things that, that, that might be boring for the audience, but if you're interested in, later on, maybe we can talk about the media legislation. Thank you. Thank you, András. Mr. Hanash, the floor is yours. Um, is it working? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, joining Andras in thanking for the occasion. Um, I asked a colleague to distribute a document um, in which, uh, in January 2011, with 70 former dissidents, 70 former anti-communist dissidents, um, we signed an appeal to the European institutions. I wrote it, which was the last one, last international appeal that Václav Havel has signed, and, um, and um, where we did kind of answer the initial question of yours. Is Hungary still a democracy? Now, um, the answer is Hungary is a democracy, comma, but. Hungary is not a democracy, full stop. Hungary is not a democracy, period. Hungary is a typical democracy, comma, but. You can argue for a thousand years that all democracies are comma, but, but Hungary looks is Hungary's democracy is needed in an adjective. Um, the good news is it's not dictatorship. It's not like communism was, which, which had its own adjective. It was people's democracy. And we all knew that democracies with an adjective are just plain non-democracies. Hungary is a self-confessed democracy full stop. But here are the adjectives, which actually Václav Havel's opinion was back in 2011. 
Hungary is an illiberal democracy. Hungary is a full-fledged illiberal democracy. You can look for other adjectives. It's a managed democracy. As President Putin likes to put it, it's a sovereign democracy. Um, Hungary is a populist majoritarian democracy. You can look for adjectives for a very long time because a whole library has been written about such post-dictatorship uh, and already called post-democratic regimes that all are based, as just Mr. Stumpf has put it, all are based in a legitimate election. All are based, I mean, um, if you ask the, pro uh, the, the people who in Belarus today run the government, uh, the parliament's absolute 180 um, pro-governmental uh, um, MPs have been elected all right. Um, Mr. Putin has got his power in a typical two-thirds um, um, uh, referendum. And those powers have been there, the people have voted for it. So you can call it Chavez-esque, you can call it Putin-esque, you can call it many ways. But here is the essence. The essence is that Hungary formally and in its genealogy, in its origins, is a democracy ruled by a parliamentary majority, even by a supermajority, as Mr. Stumpf has put it. But it is a democracy only in that genealogical sense. Even its majoritarianism is already a, an untruth regarding the actual support, what the government actually does. And if you compare it to the opinion of people today about the government, it's just an ultimate elitist authoritarianism because practically nothing that the government does is met with the support from the majority. The winner of the elections, my old friend, Viktor Orban, never promised or threatened before the elections that he will pervert the meaning of the two-third or 66% majority. No question, Mr. Stumpf is right when he claims that um, in the formalistically seen, the constitution, even the old one, has allowed for the government to do whatever they want with 66%. But uh, he perverted the meaning of this because when we shook hands at the round table which led to Hungary's free elections, the 66% laws were put there in order to force consensus so that no time again in Hungary the government can do whatever they want to do alone. Uh, force consensus beyond the government, involving um, a larger majority than what the government has. And Mr. Stumpf is simply not saying the factual truth when he says this is unprecedented and this might be the cause because of the for the misunderstandings that Hungary has to meet today in the world. This is not the case. The Hungary's second freely elected government, that from 90 four to 98 was a socialist liberal coalition government had actually a bigger majority than the today one. How can you forget about it? And that government had the same absolute uh, constitutional power and of course it had never in mind except for one sinful effect, that of the municipal law at the very beginning, to do that. It has put into the constitution, that government, that the constitution can be changed only by four-fifths of the parliamentary majority. It has created a media law involving uh, um, the Fidesz party, the, the present, uh, the, the, all, the, all the opposition parties of the time in order to forge a consensus media law so that nobody can claim that the government does in the media again what it wants. He never promised 
that he will pass a new constitution for the, it is true for the first time for the first time in 1949 the communist constitution with the support of one party alone against the protests of all other parties except the far right just the opposite he expressly promised he will not disturb the constitutional order. He never promised that he will govern by retroactive laws, something that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the second biggest sin against rule of law. And dozens and dozens of retroactive laws are passed today in Hungary with the Constitutional Court deprived of the possibility by another change of constitution to check on retroactive laws. He never promised that um, he will, uh, with the help of those two-thirds laws, create institutions that are headed for nine, 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 nine years by his appointees. Already the nine year, the habit of nine year appointments defies common sense and defies the sense of rule of law. Because every each, here is another and he never, never promised item. He never promised that, that all independent institutions and all branches of government, without exception, will be swept under the execution with the help of those appointments. Um, now, the rule is, his appointees are there for nine years, two and a half democratic cycle, and after that, they can be replaced only if another two-thirds votes in a new candidate. Means they are lifetime appointees in all practical terms. He never promised, speaking of the media law, that he, just the opposite, he again promised he will not pervert the media order, that he will put the whole of the media under a solely government party board, an absolute unprecedented issue in what we call Europe, and with an absolute power and absolute intransparency in matters of licensing. I fully agree with Andras that um, the uh, extreme content restrictions that are in the media law and the extreme punishments that are in the media law have never been executed. Actually, they can't be, um, they can't be executed after Neely Cruz, the Communication um, the com 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 Commission, uh, has annulled practically um, these things. And after the Constitutional Court, uh, ruled that it is extreme that the media board has power over an online and on the print media as well. Therefore, the content restriction on these two genres are invalid. But I was, and Andras knows that very well, because he is the only um, right-wing or conservative uh, journalist who dared to ask my opinion about this, and he interviewed me about this, um, he knows that I always thought that the real power of this uniparty media board is in the licensing rules. As a result of which, Andras, Hungary's media landscape by today, after two years, has transformed into a typical post-Soviet media landscape where you have three parts of the system. Broadcasting, with very, very few exceptions, let me talk about it in a moment, um, like Radio, Ra Radio Eko Moskvi in Russia, or like Club Radio and, and one cable station, ATV in Hungary, these are the only exceptions. Broadcasting is fully, fully in the government hands, just like everywhere east of Kiev, let's say. Print press is dying, there is a fragile pluralism in the print press, it is dying, and online is opposition. Online is free, actually the only development, the only good news is that online journalism has even developed under this pressure, which is a good, good thing. But not thanks to the media, though. 
despite the media law. And finally, because he mentioned the election law. It's in the pipeline. In incremental ways, the government, as we talk, as we talk, they are changing on the go the election laws. And the final um, issue they do is they introduce registration. Now, Andras has already voiced the apology of the government for doing this. You have it in America. You have it in many European countries. Why is it not democratic there? Why is it, demo why is it undemocratic in our country? Just because Hungary is not understood or not beloved. Or just because Viktor Orban has this unprecedented two-thirds majority, which is not unprecedented at all. No. The right answer is, and I give this answer in my capacity as the former head of the election mission of OSC in the, 19, in the 2010 midterm elections in the USA. I was the head of the election mission in our report, which is online. Pages, pages are about how retrograde, how incurably, basically anti-democratic, anti balanced out only by the democratic force of the press is the fact that the U.S. does not have a state-maintained list of voters. Um, that country simply cannot have it for two reasons, because the federal government simply doesn't have the power to introduce a nationwide voter list and to introduce IDs, picture IDs for everyone, um, identity cards. Um, but without exception, every each election mission commentators, standard setters, recommenders of how a democratic election looks, recommend that countries that still, this is the key word, still have a voluntary registration system change to a state-maintained uh, register of voters. And um, actually, Hungary is the only country not in the democratic world, in the whole world, which goes backward from a well-maintained state uh, voter system to a voluntary registration system. What's the approach against the voluntary registration system from a democratic point of view? That it is full of manipulation. In my report, in, in OSC's report about the 2010 midterm elections in the US, we have pages about the um, disenfranchisement, uh, uh, the reading voters from the rights, using the registration, the voluntary registration system. It's called voter blocking. It's called voter caging. It is the contest of one side of the other side's registration's validity, and, and, the, and so on and so on, which are all excluded by a simple system which Hungary, thanks to communism and all countries here in the region, thanks to communism, bureaucratic as it was, we have a voter list and an ID. And um, finally, in my mind, the greatest jeopardy, the greatest comma but, why democracy comma but, is the loss of uh, rule of law, the legal certainty. I don't know what's the right English for this because I simply couldn't find the legal certainty. It means what Roger Scruton in the, in the first minutes, in the first panel, stressed trust. Trust in the, in the laws, trust in the rules. Um, the good news is Hungary is an illiberal democracy, but without, thanks God, the violence, the organized violence, or impunity of violence that you, as a result of a protracted illiberal system, you have almost everywhere. We don't have it, thanks God. Uh, the good news is that this is a democracy without rule of law. Everything in this, in this country today depends on my erstwhile friend, 
I would dare to say my student, <laughs> Mr. Victor Urban. So it, here is another very topical adjective, if you wish, Kafkaesque. It's Kafkaesque, <laughs> very topical in the Czech, Czech lands. Um, it is a rhapsodic, capricious, whimsical, supreme will that rules everything in this country. Very much a coma but a coma but. So before Andras will have opportunity to react, you can make some notes. Uh, Andre Boita. Um, okay. um, I will be much shorter than uh, than Miklos because um, he was kind of uh, listing many of uh, my arguments and many of my points uh, about how the kind of systematic attack against the usual checks and balances uh, of, uh, of executive power uh, were da done uh, in the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, as to the question of the panel itself, um, uh, this is a question that we ask ourselves every day and we don't yet know the answer uh, uh, it will be known uh, pr probably uh, uh, in two years time uh, with the with the with the elections with the parliamentary elections and whether the parliamentary ele parliamentary elections will be rigged or not if they will be rigged uh, then we know for sure that hu Hungary is not a democracy uh, anymore to the long uh, it's true uh, that uh, it's certainly true uh, however that the type of consensual democracy which was created uh, uh, in 89 uh, 90 with all the institutional fr framework supporting this uh, and which was very much rooted in the thoughts of uh, of uh, of in the progressive thinking of the 80s about uh, civil society, about the power of the powerlessness, uh, about civil society uh, being able uh, to govern itself through the right institutions and control politicians, this system has been done away with. Uh, uh, the process of doing away with it began uh, well before uh, the elections uh, two years ago uh, in the in the electoral campaign and the, in the general ideology of uh, of uh, or the general rhetorics about cr crisis this was the main element of how Orban and this I, with this I would answer the third question about nationalism um, of um, um, of this written um, um, uh, thing, agenda, that, uh, that Orban managed to convince uh, the huge majority of the Hungarian voters that something has gone terribly wrong in the past two years. That, uh, that uh, and it was well before the, the, the economic crisis, that d democracy doesn't work, democracy doesn't work for the Hungarians. And I think it was more, more, uh, and uh, it had very strong connotations in Hungarian culture, which is very much centered on defeat. Uh, uh, so it was a very, uh, very apt, very clever, and and sensitive rhetorics in the sense of um, of you know how to get uh, power. And. Uh, and then came what came uh, after uh, after this overwhelming victory of uh, of 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 uh, of Fidesz, uh, the, the systematic, uh, uh, if not total, but still uh, substantial destruction of these checks and balances. To which I add, uh, which are listed by Miklos, to which I also add the. Uh, maybe the, the most fearful aspect of the whole thing, the, the attack on the judiciary. Uh, the attacks were usually to track institutional changes and personal changes. Uh, in many cases, both uh, happened. Uh, 
and uh, it led to the creation of a political machine where there are no hindrances either from the opposition, from the media, from, from anybody. Uh, a machinery which was, uh, the goal of which was uh, to, to create policies, to create politics. And uh, the most, uh, the, the, the saddest thing is that, that, that this didn't happen, that uh, the whole system seems to serve uh, only itself. Uh, so Hungary is not uh, in a better shape economically uh, uh, than it was uh, when, uh, uh, when Orban came to power uh, two and a half years ago. It, it's in worse shape in, in many, many ways. There are no reforms. Uh, uh, and one last thing to add about uh, the, the future elections. It, it's not just registration. It's also gerrymandering and not, uh, you know, I mean, uh, any government uh, who is in, uh, in any country who is in the position of, uh, you know, of, of playing a little bit with the electoral districts uh, would eventually do that. Uh, the, the expression itself comes from the United States. But uh, the redrawing of electoral districts uh, was uh, wholesale and pretty much uh, evidently uh, preferring the, the present interests and the present picture of the governing party. Also, the, apart from registration and gerrymandering, uh, and I think we should come back to registration to, to put it in a social context, what does that mean uh, for, uh, for the alternation of power, for the possible alternation of power. Uh, also, Orban, uh, basically Orban and his party, but the party is a tool for Orban, uh, pretty much evidently, uh, transformed the, uh, the, the parliamentary system into a majoritarian system, which is not, which can be democratic, which is democratic in many countries, although uh, I would c call it a rather stupid democracy, uh, without the, um, the proportional element. Uh, uh, but clearly, uh, the idea is that it would help the majoritarian system <coughs> would help to stabilize the power uh, of, uh, of Fidesz given the fragmentation of the opposition and the obvious or seeming perhaps impossibility of the opposition forces to unite uh, against the governing party. Well, that would be yeah, for the first round, and, but I hope we would come back also to the media law and I could tell Andras why we had the blank cover. Maybe now Andras would play the role of defender, <coughs> just to explain. I, I, I don't want to play any, any kind of role. I just uh, want to add things and uh, there are some things I agree with, but a lot of things that I don't. First of all, the big problem of the two-thirds. Um, it's it's just not true what you said, Mr. Harasti, because uh, in the campaign, if you remember, the last time, and it, it will be the last time in Hungary, as it seems now, we had a two rounds election in 2010. Uh, after the first round, everybody saw that uh, Fidesz is very strong, and, and there's a possibility to, to have the two thirds. Uh, what, was, what was going on in the campaign, if you remember? Uh, all the socialists, all the liberals, everybody said, stop Orban, don't let Orban have the two-thirds, because then he can change the constitution and so on. So everybody knew, it's true, uh, it's, it's, about, it's because of consensus in, was uh, in the constitution in 1990. But uh, as, as you see, everybody knew about it, everybody knew that if he gets more than two-thirds, then he can change the constitution. What, what was Orban, Orban saying back then? He was saying, the old constitution, I mean, that we don't have now, uh, is just a technical paper, there is just technical papers, um, and, and it has no soul, and, and if he has big success, then big changes are coming. 
if little success, so no two-thirds, only a simple majority, then little changes are coming. That was clear to, an, to anyone. Uh, Mr. Boita wrote about it, that everybody should uh, vote for the socialists, the only newspaper in Hungary uh, that made it, uh, made it in 2010. That was quite, uh, quite funny to me, but, uh, but it's my personal view. Uh, so it was clear that uh, what, what is coming when, when Orban has the two-thirds. And he, and he won the election with, with two-thirds, so the, the people just wanted it. To, to have him such power, to, uh, to be able to change the constitution, to change the media laws and all the laws that are uh, only to change with, with the two-thirds. Uh, second, is it uh, an un un <laughs> un So, in 1994, so, sorry, my English is only, uh, this English is, is my third language. I speak German much better, but I don't think you all speak German, so I, I will try in English. Um, and Hungarian, of course, much, much better. But so in 1994, uh, there was a coalition, which is not the fact now in Hungary. So if, when you say, OK, but, but the, then uh, they could have changed the constitution, but the, they did not, th that's, that was a whole, a whole different uh, political situation. The liberals and the post-communists were on coalition. And of course, they had a, a big power. But in 1994, only four years after, after the big changes, after the communists were gone, they were back in power. Of course, they, they and, and the liberals, the, the former um, opposition of the communists, were with them in coalition. They, of course, had this kind of uh, agreement. Um, which, but, but there was a whole, whole different situation in, in Hungarian politics, so you, you cannot uh, speak about it. So it's, uh, there was no precedent to, to this kind of non-coalitional one-party, two-thirds that we have now. Um, other things, what, uh, what I wrote here. The, si the system itself, if it's... Uh, so in, in reality, for example, the media council that we have now, it, uh, it's um, made out of uh, Fidesz close people. It's, it, it's, it's a fact. Uh, but the system itself is, is democratic. You, you can't say it's not. Uh, they are chosen, uh, elected by the parliament with the two thirds and so on. And if they want to act, and if they want to act, and, and this is uh, the res responsibility of these people and these institutions, if they want to act for, for the uh, public and only for the public, and, and they don't want to uh, do no political uh, and political pressures. They they can say no. These nine years uh, they are elected for. Uh, nobody can say. Uh, not even the prime minister, not the parliament. Come back. I'm not satisfied with your work. They do what they think uh, is is for for the public. And if they they have wrong decisions and and political decisions, we have to write it. You do. I also do. We write it, for, for example, uh, in, in cases like Club Radio, that this was uh, a decision made uh, because of, uh, we, we think, a political um, pressure. And you, sh you should, should not do things like that. But, but if they want to act as only for the public, they can do it. And the prime minister can't do anything. The parliament can't do anything. They are there. So the, the system itself is okay. Of course, uh, of course, not always wor working. But what happens? You write it. I write it. Everybody writes it. Uh, and and if the people think uh, the people know about this in Hungary, and if they think it's not okay, we don't want this kind of system. It's it's horrible. Then they go and they vote for someone else, who wins the elections, and this will be a way. And I think this is a democracy. Well, uh, do, 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 does everybody know about the Club Radio case, or do we do we need to stop uh, by for, no, for a minute? Well, yeah, yes. Does anybody know about the Club Club Radio thing? But I mean, I would rather first. Do you watch public TV on Dash? Uh, no. Well, it's very biased. Uh, it's totally undemocratic. It's run on taxpayers' money and lying into taxpayers' face for the money. I don't think it's a particularly democratic uh, practice. I think uh, if we can call Lukashenko because Belarusian state TV democratic, then I have no problems with calling the Hungarian public broadcast 
service is democratic. What you are talking about... Public uh, service media, that's, 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 that's the biggest le problem. Le I, I le agree. Legitimacy. Okay, it might be legitimate, but uh, uh, legitimacy is a question, you know, I mean, uh, how you set the rules. Now, in the previous... Under the previous, in the last 20 years, the rules were su set such a way that both government parties and opposition parties had a representative, a say, in the uh, public broadcasting board authority, whatever, which by itself, which was not a not a perfect system. It resembled too much to the Austrian sort of big coalition, you know, with all these dirty deals in smoke-filled back rooms and all that stuff. It was corrupt. A lot of I, I agree yeah. with that. But still, together with this, all this corruption and nasty, you know, ruka um, ruku mie practice, uh, it was much, much better than what it what is now, and that's what I was trying to hint at. Uh, you know, with Orbán's rhetoric about the crisis, it was very easy to depict those state of affairs, and you can. And I'm not only talking about the you know the media law, whatever law, whatever segment of Hungarian society you take it. It it was uh, in fact uh, practiced, uh, and what. Uh, yeah, that's your turn. No, no, you can. No, no. It's okay, a, just a, very a case bit, study. Uh, just, just give a very factual thing. Club Radio is um, a rather opposition-minded... Not rather opposition-minded, it's owned by people who, yes, who, at the same who are related to the Socialist Party. So, uh, or, or the form, former, former this liberals. Is not, yeah. This is not what I know and think about it. It has, it, it has been and always been... Um, a socialist and liberal minded radio and um, and it um, it remained the only one and um, the uh, media board the uniparty media board has deprived it both of its frequencies to put it short the um, courts have three times judged that uh, the decision was illegitimate um, breaching a uh, breach of law and the media authority and here is the proof of how it works unchecked power with political support they simply have ignored the ruling so although they give the mercy of two months lease continued since two years to this radio so that they can claim the radio is still in, out in, uh, is broadcasting. They give them two months leases every time, meaning they are under, and it's so typical of the whole system again, and it is a result not of the media, but it's a result of the whole system, that just like east of Kiev, advertisement revenue is totally guided. Club Radio is victim of that in two, in two ways. One, state advertisers, which is a growing number in Hungary, there is a huge re-nationalization re going on, just like in a Putinesque way. Um, every so-called strategic and, and, and strong industry is getting back its, its government owners. And only two days ago, the, another two-thirds law was tabled in Parliament, which gives the government the right to check on practically every each company in the country, um, based on the fact that um, they have some sort of government money or subsidy, or at least they, they give taxes to the state. So the point is that um, the state-owned state-dependent um, uh, companies simply don't give any advertisement. The state-fearing companies don't dare to behave differently. They follow the advertisement pattern of the state-owned ones. Plus, if, if, 
if there were some independent advertisers in the country, their shareholders would kill them if they would give advertisement to a company which only has two months, two months plans, which, which cannot be sure of continuing after two months. Game is over. So um, this, is, this is the situation which is not wise because even Putin saved Echo Moscow, the only thing, and when I met Minister Lavrov um, about media freedom back five years ago, the first word he said, Miklos, what are you talking about? You just came from Echo Moscow, you gave there an interview, didn't you? So it was, it was very clear to him that this is a showcase. Point is, uh, the, the, um, if Masaryk said that democracy is discussion, there is no discussion in the country. Actually, Viktor Orban, back to your factual correction, Viktor Orban, since two elections, have not taken prime ministerial debate. He refused to take part in prime ministerial debate. And between the two rounds, meaning in the last two weeks, it was the campaign of his opponents who claimed that this man is able to change our constitution alone with the only support of his party. He said only the one statement you have quoted, yes, if there will be big support, then there will be big changes, but not in relation to the accusations about changing the constitution, just on general. So the point is, this was perfect avoidance of discussion even in that point. It, you are not supposed to know the electorate that I am changing the constitution by the arguments of my opposition. If you are a democratic politician, you tell what's in your mind so that democratic account, accountability also applies after the elections. There is no accountability, as I quoted. And let me tell me one last moment about the election, electoral law. Yes, um, he is absolutely right. It's not just the registration system. It's not even just the gerrymandering. The Central Elector Election Committee has been changed the way I described. It is nine, nine, nine years appointment with a built-in uh, government majority for lifetime. And what's the caters danger? What's the other bad news? We have many illiberal democracies in the world. There is dispute going on in many of these about well, is it illiberal, is it democracy full stop. But the really bad news is this is the only one inside Europe. This is the only one inside the European Union. And um, Viktor Orban is a fantastic strat strategic mind who spotted that while you are in the ascension process, there are some checks and balances about your democracy achievements, but when you are inside, we are really independent. We are really free. There is no super ego anymore. Um, even if conservatives claim it's too much, even if they fight the European Union as a, as a colonizer, the big demonstration of the government will have the official slogan, we won't be a colony. And I guess uh, Roger Scruton would uh, absolutely agree with the fact that the European Union is an illegitimate colonizer of independent nation states. But nevertheless, I find it tragic, and Havel would find it tragic, that the European Union doesn't have the weapons in this matter. Well, I also, uh, also think if, that... If, if I may, a few words in defense of Viktor Orban and, 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 and uh, the promises he or any other Hungarian politicians made during the last campaign, as far as I understood, uh, all uh, the, the populism <laughs> level in Hungary is quite high, so everybody promises almost everything, and uh, like famous quote of former Prime Minister Jurchan, we lied morning and day and, and night. So it's kind of a proof that, that uh, uh, <coughs> I don't know if it applies so not only for Hungary, but in general, but as far as I understand, that the Hungarian politics of the last 10, 10 years is quite, quite populistic. So to promise something and, uh, before elections and then to argue that you feel fulfilled or, or not fulfilled is, uh, I don't say, the, the argument, Andras. Okay. Um, First, I also 
would like if it illiberal democracy what this is and is it good isn't isn't it good mr roger scruton is much better on this than me so i i won't comment if if you have um if you want to then then please later on um so um public service media yeah th there are problems uh, i agree uh, but you have to know i don't think <coughs> you are watching hungarian public tv uh, and nor do the Hungarians. So the significance uh, of public uh, service media is, uh, is, is ver very low. It's, it's uh, under 10% of, of, of the viewers are, are <coughs> watching news on, on, on this. So it's not like BBC or something that... Uh, that it, so, so for the demo democracy, uh, it's not that important as, as, as if, if, for example, BBC or something like that. Um, uh, yes, uh, the, there there are people um, elected appointed by, by and you can see it's not good. Club radio, that was a mistake, of course. So, uh, uh, but as you see, uh, the, the judges say uh, club club radio is right in in this these cases. Uh, then. Uh, goes to uh, the media authority goes to a higher level then the judges say <laughs> club radio is right and they go uh, on and on and on and then it there will be a decision in the end what they have to um, uh, what what they have to do so and and you 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 can you can hear club radio still um, i'm not frightened and i wasn't frightened as a journalist uh, two years ago as uh, as many of of the journalists in our country uh, were frightened, for example, Mr. Boita, uh, with with these blank pages and something, and really nothing has changed in the everyday work. As you work as a journalist, as you, as you call Mr. Horosti to uh, uh, to ask him about the media uh, legislation or something, and you write that uh, the columns that Mr. Boita writes uh, are are very oppositional and very hard kind of columns, but he also. It's, and it's okay, and, and, and of course, two years ago, it, it looked like it, the, a hysteria came, came to every, everybody in, in Europe because of Hungary. Uh, with blank pages, of course, you, you say there will be no free, because of opinions, you can be fined and something. That was sad, but that was not true. And, and there is no way to do that for the authority. Let's make it clear. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I have an additional question about, about this advertisement issue, because as a journalist, I'm really interested to know how the paper press is influenced by that. Okay, well, I mean, first of all, I would just like to give my interpretation of the blank cover pages. So when uh, we published Magyar Naranj and uh, also um, a few, um, two, two weeklies and a daily came out with a blank cover page, just like the case in Slovakia, uh, and uh, sadly enough, in Slovakia, the, if you remember the, the famous um, uh, law on uh, how you react, how you should react on opinions, and the Slovak newspapers came out with a blank page. That was the whole political spectrum of Slovak newspapers. In Hungary, it happened only, so to speak, on, 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 on the liberal or the, or, or on the left or on the left side of, um, of uh, the political spectrum. The way we had to react, we felt we had to we have to react uh, with this um, you know ultimate tool that a newspaper has uh, was the draft of the media law that was not a law at that time, uh, in which uh, very serious regulations were put uh, on on private media as well. <coughs> they could have been fined uh, to death basically on totally arbitrary. Uh, um, under totally arbitrary conditions set only and exclusively and not even said openly by the media authority run by the majority uh, party, the same which runs the public broadcasting services and the results we know. So uh, we had uh, this uh, knife on our necks, so to speak. Uh, and secondly, the media authority also would have had the right, according to that draft of the media law, which, by the way, became the media law uh, on the 1st of January. That was the end of, uh, of 2010. Uh, 2010, was it? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and the second uh, thing which directly concerned private-owned media is that the media authority would have had the right to, in, to go into your office and uh, to look uh, to all documentation they had, you, you had, including uh, uh, your financial, your business documents, and including uh, your professional documents uh, with the sources. Uh, and uh, these, these are the two most vulnerable points uh, for us. And I think that, uh, that the blank pages, uh, together uh, with the efforts of many honest people within Hungary and outside Hungary, uh, managed to move uh, uh, the, the international opinion and international politics, which in turn forced the Orban government first to back off uh, and uh, and uh, make exactly these regulations uh, lighter and uh, not only the international uh, uh, international and internal but we were the internal yeah, yeah yeah not only yeah and because so media, i think the media process media it was not it was not hysteria it was you know we kicked off we also not alone of course but we kicked off a process which resulted uh, in uh, a kind of uh, mitigated but still abhorrent uh, media regulation. Okay, uh, to just just some few few words. Uh, that was a draft, and and as it became, uh, as, it, as it was as, as it was it enacted. For example, the, the fines it it was changed. That in the in the first in the draft it was like uh, you they can fine you. Uh, and you have to pay before you go to court. And maybe you can't go to court at all. That was the first one. Yeah, that was horrible. But as it, it was enacted, uh, it, it was out of that. Uh, that, was, that was really horrible and, and really dangerous, but it never became a law. Uh, that was a plan. Uh, other things, how, how media really works uh, in Hungary. You all can see that, uh, that uh, the laws are changed because of media, because of media pressure, because of, uh, of, the, of the people and the constitutional court that announces it, as it works in a democracy. Uh, secondly, uh, this year, uh, one man called Pál Schmidt had to resign. He was president of Hungary. Why did he have to resign? It was because uh, uh, a newspaper an op from the opposition, uh, and it's good like this, wrote about the plagiarism that he had, and he uh, got his degree uh, with yeah, stealing <laughs> some, some other... Um, plagiarism. <coughs> yeah, plagiarism. And, and this was because of the media. And he couldn't... Of course, Fidesz could have done. Um, and he, he could have said that, okay, I, I stay, I don't care. We, we got two-thirds majority, I'm, I'm in my office, I stay. But of, of course, as in every normal democracy, the voice of the people, how they think of it, it it's important. And he had to resign because, because of an article and be, because of what, what he's done. And I think it's okay, it's correct. That's why we are in the media. That's why, be, uh, why we're working on, as journalists. Uh, sorry, uh, just to, to know something about, uh, about how Hungarians feel. Is uh, there media freedom or not? Uh, according to a Gallup survey, 70% uh, of the Hungarians say that uh, media is, uh, has a lot of freedom. It was uh, one year ago, it was 87%, so it's less, but uh, it's still 70% more than, uh, than, uh, than people the government has who feel that the media is still, uh, still free in Hungary and has a lot of freedom. Uh, 133 countries were surveyed uh, this year. Uh, for example, Italy, the, there is on, it, it is only 60%, and in the region, the average is, is, about, is about 80 in, in the Central European. So I don't think uh, there is so, such, such a big deal with all, all this media stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, well, um, Hungary, as I as I already tried to uh, picture it for you, has become a tripartite media system with broadcasting fully in the hands of government, whether privatized, whether commercial, whether public service, whatever. Uh, the, the broadcasting system is a dual system. 
but not like the inventor of the dual system, Britain, where you have the powerful BBC for internal pluralism and you have commercial TVs for external pluralism uh, for different viewpoints. You have a dual system where either you are propagandistic fully, just like public, public broadcasting is, uh, Sometimes for, the, for the government, for the government, or you are apolitical, you avoid politics. And this is the post-Soviet media system, which is, the, which is making free elections a farce, which is making minority rights, individual rights a farce, and which is, think of Masari, is eliminating discussion. <coughs> you know, if your media system is not free, by discussions about it in the media, let's be a little bit cynical about this. People are not media scholars. If they vote in a Gallup poll, they, they, uh, they give you their impressions about discussions in the media, not about media itself. If 95% of people get their news from the evening news of either public service broadcasting, which is fully propagandistic, or from commercial media, which is avoiding politics, then why would they say the media is not free? The institution of the scandal has disappeared in Hungary. Now, what about Parschmidt? It was an online journal. As I told you, if you wish, you can treat it in your next article as admission by me. Online is absolutely free in Hungary. That's a very positive thing, which is a bacon of the future. But, um, but this, is is not, this, is not, this is not because of the system that the government with the media law devised. This is despite of it. And the Constitutional Court, it's true, uh, Andras is right. The Constitutional Court heeded to some of the international advice, pressure, in terms of uh, the media law. And in the very last day of its old jurisdiction, when it still had the say in this thing, which was December 30th of last year, it, part of the reproaches, materialized in the, in the decision of the Constitutional Court, and May this year, the, go the government majority had to give in in Parliament. But even these last day of the, last of the, of the non-existent anymore jurisdiction of the Constitutional Court tackled the heart of the system, which is the uniparty board, and which is the <coughs> licensing power, which is shaping the broadcasting world from which 95% of people get their news. Every, just, just like in many other countries, in Hungary, people get the still, from the still plural online world the news in not greater numbers than used to be the subscribers of print press earlier. So it is the same kind of, as our first freely elected prime minister would have said, people inside the boulevard, okay? <laughs> people inside, in, in downtown. It is, it is not greater. Po point is, you have a, a neo-authoritarian media system which is more legally consequent, more legally, because this is a lawyer's, this is, <laughs> If, if this is a dictatorship, then this is a lawyer's dictatorship, <laughs> this, this country. Because it is very well devised and better than actually uh, Putin or anyone else. The great difference, as I told you, and that's very, very important, that thanks God we are not having the, um, the rampant violence, which, which is the greatest censorship on, on the world and which is the greatest inflector of self-censorship ever because it goes into the families, not only to the editors. So, oh, and Ash, and Sorry, but it was very interesting. That I don't think it's a Hungarian problem that people don't care about politics and read, uh, read uh, Yellow Press and, 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 and Tabloid and, and things like that and look uh, and, and watch uh, such kind of TVs where no politics are in. A lot of people are not interested in that. But those people who, who, Andras, who want... the point is, do you admit that the do, broadcasting do you, do you world me, is do you managed? Me, do you let me... But, but please reflect whether is it true that the broadcasting world in its entirety is managed? The question is, I think, do, do they have 
the uh, opportunity, the people who, who really want to watch political news, to have uh, these, these uh, oppositional opinions, to, to watch uh, news, for online. example, not, not only online, uh, in, in, the, in the broadcasting too. And they have, they have the opportunity. There is Art TV, that's the, that's the um, uh, and, and gets more and more important and more and more successful because it's now the opposition television, but it is there and you can watch it and there you find all the, all the hard talks and, and all the things that you need. And it, it, uh, because of that, it's more and more successful. A lot of people watch now uh, ATV, uh, the TV of the left. So, and if they have the opportunity to watch, watch it, to, to listen to club radio, to, uh, to read uh, the left, uh, left parties, I, I mean the socialist newspaper, people, People's Voice, which is the biggest, still the biggest uh, daily newspaper in Hungary, then what are we talking about? Well, <coughs> we are talking uh, about a newspaper with 50,000 daily distribution on there. It's 50,000 daily distribution. This is the biggest daily you have quoted. ATV is a cable TV, um, which you can only get in the cities. And, um, and um, it is actually a very bad TV in the sense it's only, only an opinion TV. The, let me add one more element to this. I'm sorry, but we are supposed to talk about the media as well, because actually we are right if you think it's key to democracy. Um, the, the issue is that um, in Hungary, in Hungary, you don't have, as I, as I told you, um, any kind of discussion and um, where, where you need to have discussion, you only have this broadcast element. But um, in Hungary, there is no news production outside the state conglomerate. The media law entitled the head of the media authority to order that the state or public service broadcasting only can use exclusively the government-owned news agency news. And at the same time, the government news agency news have been made available, available for free. What does that mean? It's an offer you can't refuse. It means that next day all independent news agencies uh, declared bankruptcy. They went out of business. And even portal sites and others, which in a modern world work actually as a news agency, they are the only one producing news, and that's why Mr. Paul Schmidt had to, had to resign, because the online, uh, an online outlet did, did produce the news about his plagiarism. But otherwise, the entirety of the broadcast world and uh, a great majority of the online world is only differently interpreting interpreting uh, the news produced by this gigantic state conglomerate called the Hungarian News Agency, and the public service broadcasting is simply not allowed to use any other news. But if there are news, and there are... But, but uh, Andras, it's a measure. It, it came It's out. a measure that was created in order to make the Hungarian society dependent on the news of the state. Miklos, how, how, how does the system work nowadays? Uh, if you have news, uh, that comes out in, in, uh, in an online newspaper, so on the net. Of course, the next day or that day, it was everywhere, also in Hungary. Then it's on TV, then it, it's on public service media, then it's on... Because it's real, when it's, it's hard news, and, and as it was, a plagiarism of, of the president, that is something. Of course, every, it, you, you, you hear it in every radio, in, in every television, you, you can watch it, you, you can read it in every newspaper, because it's important. So you can't say it only came out there and... Uh, of course, we produce, and also we produce uh, news, uh, as, as you do uh, in Magyar Laranj, and if you have something uh, that's really important, everybody will know about it in Hungary, and I, I think it's important, and we have to uh, debate about, about that, how we should look at it, and we do. And we do, and I think it's, it's quite normal. So I don't see the, the, the point why it wouldn't be democratic or, uh, um, or, or why wouldn't we be, not be able
for public debate or something. And as long as we are able for, to, to debate and, and to discuss things like, like that, as we are, I don't, I don't see the big problem. Of course, I would be mo much more happy if uh, public service media worked well in Hungary. It works like, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, but, but, but it's not undemocratic, but it should, should be better. Getting deeper and deeper in Hungarian problems, we, we still have about seven minutes for public discussion. So, <laughs> Roger Scruton. I have to confess an interest. I, like Miklos, I'm, a, 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 I suppose, a kind of tutor to Viktor Orban. Uh, and neither yeah. of us had any you influence. You have in my apartment in 89. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think this conversation is much too uh, involuted. There aren't enough comparisons with other places in the world. Uh, and I think, obviously, um, my country is a very good place to compare things with because we are supposed to be, ultimately, uh, the model democracy. We, of course, uh, on the media issue, we have uh, a state-owned media company, the BBC, heavily funded by the taxpayer, who's forced to pay money to have a television license, uh, which is uh, t obviously a total waste of money, given there's nothing on television worth looking at, but nevertheless, there's nothing else to look at either. So people do support the, uh, the BBC. Being a state-controlled institution, it's completely in league with the state-controlled education system too, the universities and all that, and it recruits from there. It is, by its constitution, supposed to be fair-minded. So you do have discussions on the BBC where conservatives are allowed to talk. And it's very like this gathering. There'd be one of me and two of them. You know, to, to balance any right-wing person, you've got to have at least two left-wing persons. Otherwise, it's not a fair and open debate. And that is the way in which state, educa state education systems on the whole work because the, the left-wing prejudice is programmed into it. And when you on the left lost, rightly lost the election last time, you were wiped out of Parliament, and then you went on whining and whinging, pa passing around all these letters to, the, to people in the rest of the world, saying, gosh, look, it can't be a democracy because we lost. Uh, you know, whereas, in fact, you deserve to lose. I agree with you that Viktor Orban is a master strategist and, a, and an autocrat, and it would be better for Hungary if he didn't, lose, didn't win the next election. But still, these abstract claims that it's not a democracy, just because in this or that me measure, it doesn't correspond to some uh, unreal ideal of, of what a democracy should be, seem to me to be actually sour grapes. Now, I know I'm speaking rather too furiously, uh, and in a parliament, I wouldn't be allowed to speak like this. But you Hungarians always speak to each other like this. Much worse, you're much worse than we English are. Now, you never do sit down and say, look, uh, dear Mr. Stumpf, I, I, I fully agree with you on all these issues, but not quite on this issue. Let's, let's see what we can agree about and then move on. Uh, and, you know, it would have helped if Mr. Stumpf had, had a second. I'm here as his second. Uh, but now I give up. Thank you. Well, ju ju just just for, 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 for to explain the, the sake, for the sake of discussion that uh, as I was involved in organizing this this panel from the very beginning, there were serious attempts to invite two and two people from let's say both sides, but somehow one side was kind of a death uh, to to send some 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 more people. Well, yeah. I think uh, what you said was not the point that we made. So I mean, you you. Uh, we never said, and no one on the left ever said, that Orban Viktor shouldn't govern. All what we said, he perhaps shouldn't change all the rules without even talking uh, uh, to his opponents. So, uh, and this is what in fact happened. And he, he's changing the basic rules of how we live together in this country, how we have lived together in this country for the 20 years, without saying it before, uh, without, without saying it when he was doing it. So that's not how does it work. So once again, with never anybody on the left that I know of said he shouldn't govern. Let me 
tell um, I've never been a person of the left, Roger. <laughs> Very important. Uh, it was in my apartment in 1989 that Roger gave a lecture with Viktor Orban and his whole team sitting uh, on the floor with, with um, back to the wall. What's, con what's conservatism was your lecture. <laughs> and, um, and it happened in my apartment. I, I am a, I'm a European liberal and I was in politics until 94 for four years in the first cycle, just for the record. Uh, Roger, um, the problem with what you said is, is, is very personal, but, but, but the issue is that majoritarianism, maybe this is for your science, which is, which is how traditions um, are working together with, with institutions, how badly actually. <laughs> Um, to put it, an age-old East European wisdom into those, into those um, textbooks. Majoritarianism works, this is an, you know this, is an, majoritarianism works where, 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 where the, the grass is cut for 300 years, you know. That's, that's what everybody in this region turned, because um, the prime minister, although has total power to name those boards, would never dare to do it for, uh, in order to streamline the political direction of those boards. That the Royal Charter is taken seriously and you cannot deny that the BBC is a very strong critique of the government. This type of thing has not worked. Andras is absolutely right, you are absolutely right. The rotten and corrupted um, way of exercising power before this government came would have given a great opportunity for such a big winner like Viktor Orban was to start it anew, to start it with consensus. Back in '90, we have we have <coughs> slapped each other back, saying, "Here is our Moncloa." Pact moment, you know, we, we, we dreamed together about a Dutch type democracy where the revolving stage of politics just works and everybody can mate with everyone. It was not a majoritarian British system, it was a very coalition based system. And we, Viktor Orban was party to the handshake with the former communists. Just like Adam Michnik was party to the handshake with the former communists, just like Havel in the very short um, uh, round table with, with Prime Minister Chalfa and others in 89 was part of the handshake with the former communists. That was, of course, something that, um, that um, was formalistically seen not the final constitution, but its spirit. It was a wonderful liberal constitution. I have to, I have to stop because out of fear, not, not for good reason, not for organic liberal tradition, for bad reasons because the communists were afraid of the newcomers and the newcomers were afraid of the communists and so they put a lot of liberal um, uh, freedoms into the constitution. But Victor should not have abolished them. That's the issue. And, and final, Andrei Swart. Thank you, and thank you to Roger, too. Um, well, I absolutely agree with you, uh, Miklos. Uh, I would have been much more happier when a, a consensus and, and some kind of uh, a more gentle uh, governing came in in 2010. But I think these are personal opinions, feelings that could be very important, and we can discuss about it, but this is not public interest, what we feel. Okay, you have an opinion, I have a, we have feelings, fine. But what, what we... What we know, and I think uh, I'm right in that point, uh, that the system itself is democratic. Of course, the culture, the cult to change the culture, it's a, it's a, it's a bit elitarian thing what, uh, how we, we look at it now, sitting here. Uh, but it, it takes time and, and it takes a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, writing and something, yeah, which, which, we do, which we do, and, and, and maybe uh, 
we will get to a, to a point when, uh, when, when politicians, not only on the right side in Hungary, on, on the left too, um, are not abusing um, uh, democracy in, in, in no way, uh, just because they are educated like that. That, that might come, we might come to this point, but, uh, but uh, I think what uh, we could achieve in, tw in, in 20 years, I mean, uh, in the connection of, with democracy, we, we did it. You have an opinion, I have, but the people have an opinion, and if they have an opinion, Orban should govern, he should govern, that's it. No matter if we like it or not. Then, and then, next two hours, we can discuss again and again. And next to Forum 2000, please organize us about Hungary and its, and its fate. Thank you for uh, your participation discussion. Thank you for, for the que question, comment. Lionel, sorry if there was no time for, for more more questions. Uh, thank you all. Have a nice day.